Thank you for joining us for this session of the AgriAbility webinar series. Today's session is on advocacy, working together for change. This is actually uh, one of a series of webinars that's coordinated by our nonprofit partner, April, the Association of Programs for Rural Independent Living. And it focuses on uh, one of the key core services that are provided by Centers for Independent Living. Today, uh, we have three presenters, Sierra Royster from April, also Ketra Crossan from Alpha One and the Main AgriAbility Program, and then finally, Emily Freudenberg from Easter Seals, Nebraska and Nebraska AgriAbility. Some of you may not be familiar with AgriAbility. It is a program sponsored by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and focuses on issues of disability in agriculture. Every AgriAbility project is a partnership between a land-grant university and at least one nonprofit disability services organization. Currently, there are 20 projects that are funded by USDA around the country, and there's also one national agribility project. Again, that's uh, housed, headquartered here at Purdue University in the Breaking New Ground Resource Center. Our partners on the national agribility uh, grant include Goodwill of the Finger Lakes, April, I mentioned them before, the Association of Programs for Rural Independent Living, Colorado State University, and Washington State University. There's much more information you can find out about AgriAbility, including the uh, webinars I mentioned and a variety of other resources, contact lists for the different AgriAbility projects, and you can find all that at the agribility.org website. Okay, at this point, uh, Sierra Royster has some introductory comments. I'm going to turn off my camera and mute my microphone. Sierra, if you want to turn yours on, then uh, We'll let you go ahead and present, and then we'll move on to the rest of the presentation. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> so welcome to this. Um, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to what we're going to be covering today. Um, we know that advocacy is needed in many forms with the people that we work with, whether they be consumers or farmers or clients, um, whatever that is, maybe yourself. Um, and so we really just wanted to put this together to present one of the options that is available for either teaching advocacy, advocacy skills, um, either with systems-based or individual. And we also wanted to highlight what um, Centers for Independent Living are able to provide as well as a, a partnership, um, but also understanding if maybe you're coming from the independent living side of things, what does agribility really need with advocacy? What are those needs and, and how can you partner with other organizations that might already be out there? So um, that, that's our goal for today is that you can learn a little bit more about Centers for Independent Living and the type of advocacy that they provide. Um, this is one example from one center. Um, so please know that every center is mandated to carry out individual and systems advocacy, how they carry that out is going to look a little different because they're individual programs and they're really fun, are promoted through their community and what the community need is. So please just, um, sorry if you keep hearing that, um, but please just keep that in mind and don't be afraid to ask any questions about this. Um, and I wanted to just offer myself up as um, our partnership with AgriAbility in April. What we are really trying to do is build bridges with AgriAbility programs across the country and then the Centers for Independent Living within their state. So figuring out what bridges need to be built, how can the partnership be developed, and this could just be one of the many ways that that could happen. So that's my job is to try to build those. So if you need help or if you have ideas that spark during this time that we're on this call, please um, reach out to me afterwards. You'll see my information towards the end and we can start working on those partnerships. Um, but I'll go ahead and let Ketra jump into all the meat and potatoes of the um, information about Centers for Independent Living. But thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sierra. So, um, I work for Alpha One, 
um, and we are um, Center for Independent Living here in Maine. And um, we are um, managed and directed um, by and for people with disabilities. Um, in our state, we have three offices um, across the state, and mostly where we have our phones and our, our laptop hookups and our fax machines, we spend most of our time on the road going out and visiting with people in their homes. Um, and overall, we provide um, the um, disabled community in Maine with information, services, products um, to create opportunities for people with disabilities to live independently. Um, so let's see here. Um, so at our center um, around individual advocacy, um, all of our staff are called independent living specialists. And, and our role uh, for all of our services, not just advocacy, but all of those core services, as well as other programs that we have uh, thought out for folks in our state, is to assist the consumer to be in the driver's seat as to where they're going in life, making their own choices, making their own decisions. For any of us, we want to be in the driver's seat of where we're going in our lives, but oftentimes we're not always sure, you know, where we need to go to meet our needs or even how to get there. So another part of our role as an independent living specialist is really to help to, um, to provide those tools and the information to the person that we're working with um, so that they can make those choices as to where to go and how to get there. So in essence, um, we are helping a person to advocate for themselves. So at Alpha One, this advocacy um, really begins with the very first contact through another core service uh, of the Center for Independent Living, and that's information referral. So a person will call us with a particular need or question. They're not sure what the answer is or where they need to go. And our role is to be aware of the vast amount, and I would say it's pretty vast, of disability information, services, and products um, to help answer their questions. And we also ask a lot of questions of our own to help narrow down what might be the best resource to provide. So part of information referral is that we really believe in transparency and helping to explain the steps or process so that that person can successfully access a particular resource. And bureaucracy creates a huge number of hoops that um, can be as much a barrier to accessing the service as stairs at an entrance to a business. And sometimes accessing the service could be as simple as giving the keywords to that person to what they need to say um, on the phone or through an email um, to a particular organization that opens the doors to the services they provide. So some examples of things that we help with in our information referral service, we might um, talk to them about how to access service services through uh, VR or the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services um, here in Maine. Um, it may also be how to um, find personal care services to help with um, needs of bathing and dressing and navigating um, our particular state system, which is kind of complex. I'm sure it is true in other states as well. Um, finding funding for home accessibility um, or a piece of assistive technology. Uh, there are a number of local resources we have for funding. Um, doesn't meet every particular need, but that's part of the, um, asking questions of the consumer to sort of figure out which funding option may be a good resource for them. Or it could be helping them with the process in our state for getting a new wheelchair funded through their insurance. For many of the folks we talk to on the phone um, or through email, once they have the information they need, um, they're really good to go and they can call, follow through on their own. But there's others 
who may not have the experience or confidence to follow through. So thinking back to who we want to have in the driver's seat, we prefer not to call on someone's behalf or make a referral. And so we like to do this side by side with the consumer, um, helping them with another core service of Centers for Independent Living, and that's independent living skills training. And this means that they're an active participant in the process. So they're aware of the questions that are being asked, um, and we're teaching that person a skill that hopefully they'll be able to use in the future on their own. So for example, we get a, a number of calls in our state about consumers wanting to get applications for public housing. And depending on the particular housing management company, the applications may be online or um, you have to call and request an application. So if we're going uh, with the phone call model, uh, we may sit side by side with the person and we model the first call to the first housing agency as to how to make that request. Um, for the second call, we might do some role play before we get on the phone and um, encourage the consumer to act out um, how to ask their questions. Um, and so then the person that we're working with takes the lead on this call and we're in the background for support. And eventually the consumer may be able to make additional calls on their own. And our hope is that the consumer has acquired a new skill that may even carry over to other um, calls that they need to make for services, that they have built up a, a level of confidence. So we have some other programs at our center uh, that also involve some advocacy. And this is part of another um, core service uh, for Centers for Independent Living, and that's Transition. And so we have a program right now um, in our state, we call it Homeward Bound, but it is a, a national program called Money Follows the Person. And this is funding to assist individuals to move out of nursing homes and back into the community. And so our role, um, we change our hat slightly from independent living specialist to transition coordinator. And so we coordinate a team that includes the individual who'd like to move out, their family and friends, um, the staff at the nursing facility, and also bring in um, representatives from community services that they would need to access. And so the team puts together a move home plan, and we're certainly touching on all aspects of moving into the community, housing, home access, personal care, assistive technology, durable medical equipment, and other supports that that person might need. Another program that we have around the concept of transition from one place in life to another is called PREAS, or Pre-Employment Transition Services. And in this program, we work with teens with disabilities in local schools with lessons and activities around health and hygiene, how to speak up for yourself, budgeting, how and when to disclose your disability, and other job readiness skills. And we do this in conjunction with our main Bureau of Rehabilitation. And they also help uh, with summer job placement for these students, which includes job coaching. So we've talked about what we do for individual advocacy at our center. And so now um, another aspect of advocacy is systems advocacy. So on a national level, um, there's an organization called the National Council on Independent Living that keeps uh, centers informed about um, legislation um, that would um, be helpful or support individuals with disabilities. So our center, along with our State Independent Living Council, which is a um, group of individuals that um, sort of steer where our state needs to head around meeting needs of people with disabilities, um, we work with our state congressional leaders to encourage them to support a particular legislation. Um, so on, that's a national level. On a state level, we also monitor legislation um, that um, may affect in some way uh, people with disabilities in our state. And so um, 
We speak up when needed on proposed legislation. We also initiate legislation where we work with um, key individuals in our legislature. Um, and a, a good example of this is a number of years ago, we worked with our legislature to develop a low interest loan program where money can be borrowed um, for assistive technology at low interest rates with very favorable terms to purchase those items. And at various times over the years, we've also worked with our legislature to increase pay rates for um, personal attendants or assistants that are providing um, personal care in our state to individuals with disabilities. But some other aspects of systems advocacy for us is our partnerships. So over the years, we have sought funding partners uh, to develop services based on identified needs um, in our state. Um, first one here is called Critical Ramp Access, and we work with uh, community development block grant funds in various towns in our state um, to provide a ramp, um, and certainly a, a big recognized need, probably in any state, um, to figure out how to help um, with accessibility for folks. Um, some other programs that we've had over the years, uh, funding, as everybody knows, comes and goes. So unfortunately, some of these programs have come and gone, but hopefully our impact has um, built awareness uh, for folks. So the first one called RankLink was um, developed to increase accessibility and uh, recreational opportunities for um, being on the ice, whether it's ice hockey, um, sled hockey, um, or just um, getting into the buildings physically, um, accessibility-wise, and also uh, looking at curling. And we even had a team from our state um, go, a curling team, go to um, the Paralympics um, to compete. Um, the next one called Open Waters was another recreational option that looked at um, educating the diving, scuba diving industry around making um, those um, equipment um, stores that sell dive equipment, um, programs that offer scuba diving um, open to people with disabilities. Another program that we partnered with called Job Track. Um, had funding to um, help pay for transportation for people to get to work. And then Home Rentro, we partnered with a funder to have funds to do some fairly extensive home um, modifications um, from um, beyond ramps, but um, could be full bathroom, kitchen modifications, things of that sort. So um, we also, uh, work with existing partners to continue to advocate for um, the goals around independent living. Um, again, strive for that transparency, make things easy for people to access, not have barriers to get services. So this includes our state programs that we work with around personal assistance services and also the Bureau of Rehabilitation around that youth and transition program, the PRE-S. And also we have um, Part of independent living funding is a Title VII Part B funding. In our state, we make that available as grants for individuals. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, look forward to any questions that you might have. Okay, Emily, I believe uh, you're up and I've made you the presenter. So if you want to activate your camera and microphone and Ketra, if you would like to yep, take yours off, I'll turn things over to Emily. Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Frydenberg. I'm with Nebraska AgriAbility. I've been with the program now for about five years. And I am the lead rural rehabilitation specialist within, within our program. So. I'm the one that's actively visiting a lot of our farmers and ranchers here within the state and helping them to find assistive technology to keep them farming and ranching. So Easter, or Easter Seals Nebraska and Nebraska Extension are what our partnerships are based off for the Nebraska Ability Program. 
Um, Easter Seals Nebraska has collaborated with many centers for independent living in the past for financial assistance needs, waiver services, um, Medicaid eligibility, and disability benefits planning. And they've also worked together on the implementation of Nebraska's Aging and Disability Resource Center, which is called ARDAC, ADARC, here in Nebraska. So we've worked together with them to help create that. However, within a Nebraska agribility standpoint, we have not worked with a lot of our um, centers for independent living. Um, we, however, do have a few cases that would possibly work really well with our um, Center for Independent Living. And so we're actually going to do some um, question and answers. So I have a client on the next slide that I'm going to pull up and it'll kind of give you the background of the client. And I would like you guys to answer whether it's in the chat room or by raising your hand, I believe that was what Paul said earlier. And we can put you on and you can talk about some ideas that you would have through your Center for Independent Living on how to help these individuals. And then I will tell you what we did here in the state of Nebraska. So, so the first one is a female ag worker in Southwest Nebraska. Um, she's trying to find a position in an agronomy field. She has PTSD, a sensory, sensory processing disorder. She has a high functioning autism, a generalized anxiety disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. The client has been turned away from several jobs as an agronomist. Client has an associate's degree in animal science and is 17 credits away from receiving bachelor's degree in animal science and a minor in agronomy. And she is currently still in school obtaining that. Her problem areas currently are interview skills, determining body, by, excuse me, body language, sensory issues, panic attacks, and the disclosure of her disability during the interview. How would you help her? So please, like I said, answer in the chats or raise your hand, and I think Paul has to let you join that. So. It will take a couple minutes and go ahead and uh, if you have uh, comments, please enter those into the chat area. And again, if you would like to raise your hand, click on that icon and we'll try to activate your uh, microphone or, or telephone. All right, this is Sierra. Um, can I get us kicked off with a couple of ideas? Absolutely. I see we have someone already. A behaviorist. To support, yeah. Um, and I also wanted to just give a little, I don't know, spark of what Ketcher was mentioning of some of the stuff that they did at their center. Um, so one thing that jumps out at me is that dis disclosure of disability um, and when to disclose and how to disclose. That's something that Ketra mentions at their center they do, and they actually start with their youth program there um, at that age teaching that, so all the way up. Um, and interview skills, that's definitely an independent living skill that a center could teach as well. Um, and those are all things that could they could work on. Um, and even that understanding body language and all of those things, that could be a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring that somebody else could share some of their stories or things like that. Someone just mentioned, I would assist consumer with an inter interview skills training class and role play. Yeah, Shannon mentioned that one. That's great. Awesome. Are there any other um, ideas or thoughts, comments?
Ooh, inter internships. That's a great idea too. I'm not sure everybody's able to see all the chat, so uh, yeah, we'll just uh, reiterate that last one that uh, says I would assist the consumer with an interview skill, or yeah, well, that was before that, I would assist the consumer with an interview skills training class and role play and then um, opportunities for other opportunities for internships where she could prove her skills. Uh, another one, NAMI. Uh, National Association for uh, Mental Illness, I believe, I may have got the acronym slightly wrong, but they have peer support groups that was listed, if she might benefit from those. And, and that's NAMI. NAMI. Yeah. Another one, I uh, see listed. Also see if an accommodation could be made for the consumer to have a mentor attend an interview with her. Some good thoughts. They are very good thoughts. So I'm going to go ahead and skip on to the next slide and it'll show you exactly what we did here with Nebraska Agribility. So we referred specifically to our workforce development programs because they have an interview training program and however the client currently is two hours away from the local center and is having troubles making that work into her schedule because of the time change. So where the client lives and where the workforce development center is on, it's on a very edge of a time change. So we bounce back from central time zone here in Nebraska to mountain. And so she's right on that and her work schedule doesn't allow her. So they are working on doing some things via um, a webinar connection like this at this time. So that is being helpful for her. We've also referred her to the JAN, which is the Job Accommodation Network and has gotten information on disclosure of disability during the interviews. Um, our client has been referred to Nebraska Vocational Rehabilitation but currently at this time, um, Nebraska VR is in an order of selection. So our client got put on a waiting list until those, those open up. Um, and then we did work with our Center for Independent Living to give us a worksheet on, um, on finding how work can be stressful and some tips for interviewing. Um, the closest Center for Independent Living from this client is four hours away. However, the Center for Independent Living is willing to drive out there and work with the client, so they are still in the process of getting something set up so that they can work on interview skills and also on the disclosure of disability for interview information. So, But you guys had some great ideas, and I will keep those on my list as well for when I talk to that client next if they are still continuing to have some um, problems. Um, that client did um, do um, I know one of the uh, ideas was to do an internship, and she had done an internship. It would have been the last semester that she was in the college program that she's in, so she does have some experience. It's just I, th I think her anxiety is still getting the best of her, and so working on those skills is going to be her, her key right now. Oh, and she's also working with a behavioral therapist. Right. So, we have another client. I have a female rancher in central Nebraska who has severe arthritis. Her husband was most recently diagnosed with Huntington's disease. And at this point, he's unsafe to be alone. Um, they cannot access home care at their location due to being very expensive, and they live in such a rural area of Nebraska. The wife is, is struggling to advocate for her husband, who is also a veteran. And at this time, the closest veteran-assisted hospital to her is four hours away or, or nursing home, and she isn't ready to put him four hours away from her. Um, Agribility referred her to VR services. 
Um, but she, she as well is on a wait list and she will need assistance with a tractor and a pickup. And what would you guys do? I see that one of them already wrote connect with caregiver organizations and yep, we, we contacted the Nebraska resident with her. So So can feel free to type in chat or I will uh, monitor for those that might raise their hand. And also think back again, this is Sierra, um, some of the stuff that Kesher had mentioned um, of how they're working with what they're doing at their center as well. I think there was a question. Did you see that one, Emily? Yep. Um, so, Rick, the, the tractor and pickup is to make accessible. So she currently has a pickup, but it needs a bale bed on the back. And so VR would be able to assist her in purchasing the bale bed. And the current tractor that she has is an older styled tractor. Um, and she has to be able to take her husband with her and there's not a cab on it at this point in time. So we had worked an, uh, out a plan with VR to help purchase a cab for the tractor if, when her case becomes back open because it's not safe for them both to be riding on a cabless tractor. Another comment, and again, I'm sorry that not everybody can see all the chat. There was a, a setting uh, in the uh, options that was not clicked, so um, we'll read any of those that look like they just went to the panelists. This was a comment, talk to their insurance company to see what they pay for. Another one, I would contact the local VA and ask if there is a veteran or veterans who would benefit from life on the farm to help with their uh, with their on PTSD and uh, would like to assist a fellow veteran who has a physical or cognitive disability. And that's a novel idea. They, they live in it. So the next one was, how isolated are they? Do they get support from community, church, friends, and family? They live outskirts of a town of 200. They, there's not um, church in the community. They're, you know, now that I think about it, there's not even a, a, a running gas station. The closest gas station to them is an hour and a half away. Um, so... The nearest hospital is right at two hours away. And then the local veteran facility VA that he has to attend is right at that three hours away. They do have a son in the area that can help the wife on when she needs assistance. And uh, they don't have, they're old enough that she said a lot of their older friends are passing. So that friends network is also kind of gone at this point. So I guess the answer to that was pretty isolated. <laughs> <laughs> and Ketcher, can I ask you, um, in this kind of rural situation, since you guys do a lot of um, a care assistance <clears throat> for a program like that, would that be something that could jump in and, and be a part of that? I know you it would be a lot of specifics, but just kind of hearing it. Um, well, I mean, I, I did put in the chat also wondering if he would be eligible for hospice. Um, I mean, you don't necessarily need to hospice um, with the idea that death is imminent. Um, 
so but it does provide a lot of support at least in our state it does um, supports and i also wondered whether nebraska had any kind of home care where the consumer or a family member can hire staff through state funds so they could go out and look in their local community for funding to find people to help with care They're all great ideas. Had another comment here. I uh, don't know if Friends of Man would assist them in Nebraska. Maybe it still could get involved and assist the advocating for both of them. And that's a Sierra. That's so true. Uh, a center for independent living definitely could work with the wife on what that looks like or maybe even with him as well like you had mentioned for both of them on how to advocate for themselves um, and, and what are those pieces and how could they navigate some of those um, care services um, and ask exactly for what they need which can be hard a lot of times um, is everybody familiar with friends of man i was actually just going to ask you sierra what that was I was going to ask everybody else, or if um, Diana could share with us. I'm not familiar with it. Well, I just actually pulled up uh, Friends of Man website. It's friendsofman.org. Uh, referring professionals. Submit applications on behalf of people in need of assistance. Applications are accepted only from referring professionals. Friends of Man carefully considers all applications referring to the federal poverty guidelines as well as information required on the application. If the, app, if the request is approved, Friends of Man pays the vendor for the needed items or services. Uh, helps people of all ages, and this is, says with needs in Colorado and limited types of needs in other states. So it's headquartered in uh, Littleton, Colorado. And so you'd have to see if those services might be available in another state. Absolutely. And you're close to Colorado. And that's friendsofmanaltogether.org. Perfect. I wrote her down. So I'm going to just shoot on to the next slide. So what we did here in Nebraska is we referred to Easter Seals Nebraska's alternative loan program. And she was able to purchase with that the, the box for the pickup to help with the hay. And then she was able to help purchase the cab at this time for the tractor. So that is going to be able to keep her and her husband safe while she is um taking him with her for um, all the cattle feedings and such. The, she was referred to the South Central Nebraska Area, G, Area Agency on Aging to assist with finding services for her husband. And I actually just talked with her yesterday and they were able to finally find a home care um, system that will actually come out and help. So the home care agency is going to come out two days a week and assist with her husband. So that is kind of going to relieve some of her caregiver burden that she already currently has, but it will also give her a little bit more time to get some things done on the ranch that she has been lacking in. And then she was also referred to the Center for Independent Living to help with advocating for husband's rights and the need for assistance. Um, so in the future, we look forward to learning more about um, our Centers for Independent Living here in Nebraska and would love to be able to assist our farmers and ranchers by working together. Um, all our contact information is there. So um, if you guys have any more questions, that would be, let us know. You can either chat or raise your hand and I will pass it back to Sierra. And there's a couple of things that I just wanted to mention. Um, 
There, I'll turn my camera back on. So there's a couple of things I just wanted to mention. So we gave, a, um, Emily gave some great examples there, and Petra really talked a lot about what their programs are doing and ways that they've partnered to carry out a lot of advocacy work. Um, as you can see and probably imagine that Centers for Independent Living do have a core service of individual and systems advocacy, but everything they do and everything that we do, no matter where you're from and, and what you're doing and who you're working with, it involves different pieces of that advocacy. So um, they're a really great organization to partner with to really try to find what um, it could help that individual, that skill to be built, to be able to make them stronger and more confident in themselves and understanding that they can still stand up for themselves even if they have an injury or a limitation or um, a disability, no matter what they are calling it, um, a bad bum knee, whatever that is, um, Centers for Independent Living typically do not have a waiting list. They um, will don't have to have the medical documentation to prove that they are a person with a disability. So all of that red tape that you often see with a lot of the other partners um, is really taken away when you bring in a Center for Independent Living. Um, now we came up with tons of ideas of how to support other people um, or other ways of supporting um, individuals outside of the Center for Independent Living. And that's important too, because as Ketra mentioned, there's that individual and systems advocate, excuse me, that information and referral piece that even Centers for Independent Living are using our partners and community members um, as the supports as well. Um, so we understand that there, as together as a community, we have to pull in everybody else as well. Um, so, there are a couple of things that we, a lot of times you're not gonna find a center that can do. They are not a funding source. So like, for example, of the um, consumer right here that needed help with um, their tractor and pickup, that's not something a center for independent living is typically gonna be able to do. Um, they are working on a small budget as we all understand those um, strengths too. So, they may have other information that can refer you to different places to find funding or different pots of money that can support different things. So they may have a list of places that you can go, but they're not the place to really reach out to to find the funding to help with those pieces. But they are the place to reach out to for those skill building things. Um, and one thing that I just wanted to go back to, client number one of, um, we talked about how she was four hours away from, you know, a center for independent living. Well, that happens a lot. So centers for independent living, um, Maine being an exception to that. We have a couple of states like Maine where they cover the whole state, but they usually have numerous centers for independent living within one state and they have certain counties that they cover and that's their service area. So once they get outside of that service area, they technically don't have funding a lot of times to go outside of there to provide those services. So sometimes you may find a center for independent living that's willing to go to their border of their service area and work with that individual. But the information and referral system or service is offered all over anywhere. I can call California and ask for information and referral even though I'm on the East Coast. Um, so that's provided to anybody, but those other services, like the one that we've really iterated today, um, that advocacy piece, that is where they need to be inside the service area. But a lot of times we can work with people and say, you know, can, is there any way that you can meet us and we can talk about these things? Or maybe they know of a service that provides that same thing in that local community. Um, and I do see a comment, um, we hosted a peer advocate conference last fall here in Wyoming thought our independent living center were amazed at how many attended and were impressed with the amount of peer mentoring and support there bet was between participants. And that's from Rick. Um, so thank you. Yeah, that's sometimes we don't even realize how, how many people could really come together and use um, one another in, in those different ways and, and support one another. So that's a great idea. Um, and then you find out who's in that local community as well. So I just wanted to kind of re, we go, go over again, I guess, some of those examples and talk about how the Centers for Independent Living sometimes are limited um, and what they can provide, but all, understanding that reaching out them, to them can provide a lot of services 
and a lot of options and maybe information that you hadn't thought of. And sometimes they can be a brain trust just within themselves of having a group of people on a, a presentation the same way as a Center for Independent Living sometimes can be, that um, storm bank that can just kind of throw out different ideas as well. Um, so I do want to make sure we have time for questions. So did anybody have any questions about Centers for Independent Living, advocacy, the examples that Emily gave? While people are uh, thinking about that and entering any questions in the chat or uh, preparing to raise their hands, I think I'll go ahead and do our full quick poll questions. At this point, I, I will open it up to any of our panelists for the questions that we have, and I will share those on uh, the screen so that people are able to see those. I need to switch myself to the presenter. That would make it easier. OK. I will share. First question, any one of our panelists, if you'd like to respond to that. I think everybody's on mute at this point. Um, hi, this is Ketra from Maine. Um, our particular CIL um, does not um, become involved in litigation. Um, we typically refer them to a, a legal entity in our state called Disability Rights Maine. Um, and so they uh, come equipped with the more legal background for addressing um, issues of discrimination or um, things around the Americans with Disabilities Act and so forth. Okay. And this is Sierra. Just so a lot of times, yes, we see where they're actually referred to exactly who Ketra had mentioned, the disability um, rights organizations within your state. Um, but a lot of times you'll see the Centers for Independent Living um, walking with them through those steps, though, not just saying, here, you need to go here, but supporting them in that and, and helping answer questions or maybe even, you know, you should probably ask this or make sure you share these pieces along the way. So. Um, and there are several centers across the country that do have um, lawyers and a legal department piece to them, um, but not all. And I think um, maybe the, yeah, so there is a list for finding your local center for independent living, and I can list another one as well. Um, and you can always call and ask them if they have that option near you. Okay, thank you. Some other question asks about uh, Involvement with VR issues. If you have comments on that? Um, this is Ketra again. In our state, um, we may provide guidance to the consumer um, as to what's available for helping um, with a, um, a cap appeal. Um, once the person is is hooked up with uh, cap, um, we usually are not directly involved, um, but we can make them aware of the resource and, and what kind of things that the cap is available to do. Okay, thank you. And, and this is Sierra. A lot of, yes, that's a lot of advocacy work is particularly with vocational rehabilitation within cells. Um, so they're very well versed a lot of times um, with their local VR. And then, of course, bringing in CAP as well. So, yes. And for those that may not be aware, CAP stands for Client Assistance Program, which is the appeal process for vocational rehabilitation issues. And one other question. Is there a, a listing of centers for independent living across the country? And I think Rick dropped in one from Nickel, that link down there, and then I dropped in one that 
pulls a map up of the whole country, and you can just click on it and find your local one as well. Okay. Let me double check that. It may have gone. So those went to uh, the panelists. I will see if I can copy those and put them in to all participants. Here, I can do it real quick. It was just a setting issue again. There you go. There we go. I think that's visible to everybody now. <clears throat> so you can go to the Nickel website or the ILRU.org website. And we'll leave that up for a, a couple minutes after the session ends so that people can access those if they'd like to. We are drawing in uh, to the end of our hour. Thank you to everybody, uh, to our panelists, to Sierra, Ketra, and Emily for preparing and presenting today. And we also want to thank everybody that participated, especially those that contributed to our discussion through the chat. Um, if you have more questions, uh, I will leave Sierra's contact information up again for a few minutes after we close officially today. And feel free to contact her with more questions about independent living or about the interface between Centers for Independent Living and Agribility. Feel free to contact me also if you have uh, other questions about agribility. And with that, we will end our session for today. And uh, hopefully you will be able to join us again in the future. Thank you. <laughs>